Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, it's hard to start these conversations with people that are my friends because I'm like, well, I, I know you. So like, yeah. what's up? Um, <laughs> but I think it's exciting that I we recorded your interview, you may recall, almost two years ago. Yeah. Uh, which and is so terrifying. much has happened since then. And so much has happened since then. And so part of wanting to re-record is because so much has happened, but also because, um, I mean, that's kind of it. It just gives me another excuse to talk to you and record. And now we get to like have this video component in the Zoom times. Yeah. So so tell us, tell my dear <laughs> listeners, uh, who are you and why you are so lovely? Go. Um. Uh, my name is Sarah Anthony. <laughs> um, I am a mostly have a producing background, um, starting to get into writing. Um, I love dancing. <laughs> no, I mean, I have a, I have a wide variety of interests outside of filmmaking, but filmmaking is such an all consuming job that mm -hmm. I don't get a lot of time to practice those yeah. uh, things that I love, but they are part of who I am. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, tell me a little bit more about producing particularly I'm curious like where in your journey how did you discover producing and then go oh like this is a thing I can do for money and that's weird how did that all come about yeah I actually um when I first started in the film industry it was as a PA in feature films and I saw a lot of producers because I was sort of on the office PA side and I did some set peeing but I became a production coordinator pretty quickly and I spent almost two years doing that just going from film to film to film with the same team and um, I saw a lot of different types of producers and I didn't ever want to be a producer <laughs> I, mean, I didn't like because being coming up through the crew and hearing the way people talk about producers and seeing the way they act is especially on low budget films I was like will you um tell us a little more about some of those things that you hear and how people act um, or at least back then maybe it's probably different now but yeah I'm sure it's different now because this was 20 years ago um <laughs> time flies <laughs> yes um uh, well, you know, it was always like, oh, God, the producer's coming. Oh, no, the producer. Like, they, they're they just going to tell us we don't have the money. They're, they don't actually care about the creativity. They only care about the bottom line. And it was like, and there were there was an attitude that there were a lot of producers who got into it because of the glamour of film, because they had money, but mm -hmm. weren't artists in their own right. And that was a that was a lot of the attitude about the people that I was around in the early my in my initial days in filmmaking, and I didn't like it. I didn't yeah. like filmmaking at all. I didn't like the way people took themselves so seriously and got so stressed out about making movies. Mm. <laughs> I was just, I mean, I was a little self righteous about it, but. <laughs> I I really just didn't like it. So I left and uh, I went to London and I was uh, just temping around trying to figure out what to do. And I, I did the artist's way and started As doing do. stand-up comedy because that was the scariest thing I could think of when they asked that question in the book. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I started doing that. And then the company that I was working at um, offered me a temp job or offered me a full-time job in their human resources department. And I was like, Oh God, no, I don't want to go into human resources. So then the only thing on my resume was film. So I sent it out to a few film companies and I got a call to go in for an interview. And they said, you do know we do documentaries, right? And I had no idea that they did documentaries, <laughs> but I was like, Oh yeah, of course I know. I've always <laughs> wanted to do documentaries. And I really loved 
doing documentaries and in the documentary world, the producer is much more creatively mm. involved than they yeah. were in my experience of film, which I know is not everyone's experience of film. Like now, late now, 20 years later, I understand <laughs> what, what a, a, a really great producer does. Um, oh, you have to tell us. I'm dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the documentary world, producing was more creative and there were, and, uh, I got to do field producing on films that went all over the world. So I got, to, I got paid to travel, which is actually all I really wanted. <laughs> what is field producing? How, how define that for us a little bit, how that's different from what most people may think of when they hear the word producer. So a field producer would go out into the field to the, <laughs> on location to wherever you're filming and get everything set up in advance and make sure everything goes smoothly while you're there. And depending on the project, they might also go and interview subjects in advance to help you find the characters for the film. Mm. Is it, how, how similar is that to a segment producer? I don't know what a segment producer is. Well, I don't either. I've just heard of the term. So I was like, well, this is I why think we're that's making, a television term that, mm that I'm not as familiar with. Um, I've worked on two television shows since we last talked, which is actually the first time I'd worked on a television show. Um, And I was a field producer on um, Why We Fight season two. And Mm. that was just going out and finding the characters, pre-interviewing them and then, you know, making sure everything worked out. But we didn't have segment producers. We had Hmm. story, story producers. Who came in after the field producer and worked with the edit. Um, And that's what I'm doing on the show I'm on currently. I did the field producing and then I'm also doing the story producing, which is more writing. That's so interesting because I would just... I would just call that like producing. I mean, it is all producing, but I like yeah. I've been doing versions of that, but I never knew they were like subtitles or different I know. Titles. I didn't understand <laughs> it when I when I... For, on, worked on my first TV show, I was like, why do you have all these different jobs and have a director? Yeah, and what's the have point? A, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I was like, why don't you just have one producer who does all of this stuff? Um, <laughs> and now we know why, right? Because it's so intense. It's so much work. Can you imagine? So much work. Like you need all those people. You, yeah. you actually do. It's remarkably actually... hard. <laughs> television is much, I honestly think, much harder to make than film because it the schedule is so much shorter yeah like we don't have and this is something I just learned recently in the documentary world we do not um focus on script as much as we should in the beginning I believe Mm. we tend to go into the edit and try things to see if they'll work and some of the principles of the scripted world could and should I think be applied to the documentary world in advance of doing your interviews so that you get what you really know you really need well I think it's like making a doc depending on the kind of doc you're making it feels very much like you are still telling a narrative film it's still a narrative story with characters with arcs with conflict but you just never find that until later So it's like, how much can you get ahead of time to have a little bit of a blueprint of where you think it could go? Um, I think, but yeah, every doc has different needs and demands, but I do think that certain projects, especially if they're not truly like archival, um, if they're sort of like your, the story is unfolding in real time, which tends to be a lot of the projects you are a part of. I think those projects do benefit from having like almost like development up front, you know, like having this period where you can kind of really hone in on three things that you want to follow versus like the, the normal approach of like, let's just see where this goes and make the best of it, you know, and hope for the best. Like it's a very um, destructive way of storytelling because I think it's so much harder. It's not for the faint of heart. I mean, it's intense. It is you know different. more than I do, and you've you've actually been, and I do want to get into that, like into in some actually terrifying situations um, to bring some of the stories that you've been a part of to life. Like you've really put yourself in the front line to me talk talk about field producing, like you're 
in it with with everybody you know you're so close to the action and it's I'm sure it's exciting in many ways but also terrifying in others and I don't think a lot of people can stomach that kind of um real world insight yeah it's it's definitely it can be difficult for people to stomach and I I definitely recognize how um jaded is not the word at all but inured in a way hmm. almost um and this is just a silly example but i was in the dominican republic and we were filming at a trash heap and there were i mean beyond hundreds of thousands of flies just it, you if you open the door of the car for a second the car would be full of flies it was that kind yeah. of situation and the two dps that i was with were like oh oh and i just didn't even i just wandered out into it and was just like observing things because i had been in places <laughs> in, uh, or you know in in other countries where i was like I'm used to flies. They're, that's fine. Yeah, you're like this is normal. <laughs> but, this is like a luxury. Yeah, that's that's like that's, that's a silly example. But there, you do have moments where you you like when we were doing the Price of Free, and we would the first time that we went on a raid with Kailash and his team. And the Price of Free is the a story of Kailash Satyarthi, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for rescuing child slaves. And so also he won and Sundance. Team break into factories and sorry. It also won Sundance, but we're, you know, no oh. big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was its own kind of weirdness. <laughs> but um but the first we we went on a development trip to see for two reasons. I had been to India before and I knew that it was a bit of a culture shock. And I wanted the director to have some time there before we started filming to acclimate the environment um but also we wanted to see whether we could actually shoot one of these raids and capture it on film and whether it would be safe and dramatic <laughs> you know all of those things all of the things all yeah. of the things and um it was remarkable it was a lot safer than i thought it would be but it was harrowing in the way that these kids tried to escape they they, they they're told that if someone comes like the police or something that they're being kidnapped or they're going to be you yeah. know that something bad is going to happen to them so they're mm -hmm. trained to hide and they ran up onto the roof and we couldn't find them in this place but it was clear that that a lot of people were sleeping in this very um uncomfortable environment you know concrete floor kind of situation and um we found them on the roof and they all came down and they were all barefoot and they all had glitter over their feet because they had been making wrapping paper for mm -hmm. like Christmas <laughs> presents and stuff. And I, it was, it was kind of shocking and I still have a little bit of like PTSD around glitter. I mean, which, which is a weird thing because it's associated <laughs> with parties. <laughs> so it, it happens a lot at festive occasions where I have like a little trauma around glitter, but that's not something you really want to talk about at a party. It's not, but I, 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 I think it's a incredible visual how powerful this, this, this thing that we associate with happiness and celebration to be connected to, to an image of something that's so real and is truly like the the life journey of that ornament or whatever that thing is that they were making where it's come from you know it's yeah. that reminder of what the doc is so powerful at doing is showing you this and I think we can very easily detach from that it's so easy to feel like well that's happening over there and it's like yeah. we we all have our own um I think ways to make peace with certain choices that we have made in the past um but I think it, it but just to back it up a little bit I think it's just incredible that you know a lot of the producers I speak to and especially people who go into the field of documentaries like they really are the kinds of humans the kinds of souls that are just like open heart balls to the walls and they're going to go and they're going to be in these environments they're going to see this stuff and they're going to capture it so that we can then sit in the comfort of our home on netflix and have this experience you know of something that is actually happening in real time 
And, um, and I think that's incredible. You know, I think that I, I commend you so much for, for choosing whether it, you chose it or it chose you, you know, <laughs> but for choosing to do something with your life and your career that most people would not be able to do. And you are doing it time and time again. And you're here you are like finding ways to <laughs> laugh about it, not laugh at it, but just find the humor and the sort of irony of all of it, because it is, it's like, you know, life is either a comedy or a drama. It just depends on the day, well, I guess. Well, comedy or tragedy. <laughs> comedy, yeah, yes, or tragedy, and it's both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but all, but all the but to back it up yeah. just for a minute, because I was the one who sent you down a path, <laughs> um, with because I have too many questions. Ah, not enough time. Um, so, okay, so you discovered that making docs was a thing. Back it up to there. And so what was that discovery like? And then what was the first project that you became a part of um I was a I did like a little bit of archive research on um commanding commanding heights the battle for the world economy I helped them like finish up in post and then um there was campaign against terror it was a frontline piece and i did i helped them going through archive and it was really crazy sorry this is a tangent but <laughs> it, the film for i when 911 happened i had just moved to london and i didn't have a television in my apartment i didn't have mm. furniture or anything so I was shopping in furniture stores along the street and I saw it happen on television in one thing and I thought it was a movie. And then I saw the, the same, I was like, that's weird. They're watching the same movie. And then I went home and somebody called me and told me what happened, but I hadn't seen it. And so I was doing archive research on this film and I still have to watch archive of the people jumping out of the buildings. And I was just like, it was like a gut punch. I was like, Oh my gosh. But it was also like, wow. Okay. Um, film is powerful. <laughs> um, but um, from there, I, I did a couple of random things like the harems of the Ottoman Empire and the author PG Woodhouse. And I just loved it because every film was like a masterclass in a new subject. And then I, they did a piece with Robin McNeil from the McNeil Air News Hour called Do You Speak American? And because I was originally had grown up in America, um, I was able to connect them with a lot of people. And so they promoted me to the associate producer and allowed me to travel on the shoots with them. So I was being paid to travel and I was meeting new people in every place. And I yes. was like, this is the best thing ever. Um, and then they got a call from Frontline to do a series on the history of HIV around the world. So I campaigned to be an associate producer on that project and got to travel to Brazil and Thailand and around America and Europe a bit. Um, but everywhere that I went in the place that they sent me was the worst place you could go in that place mm. because of the nature of the subject matter. Yeah. So it was not like touring the world. <laughs> yeah. You're not sunbathing in Rio. <laughs> no. no. Um, you're not. <laughs> yeah. And and you, you, I learned about the worst of humanity because HIV appears wherever there are those cracks in the social fabric. And you see greed, you see bigotry, you see hatred and violence. And then you see like apathy and ignorance and fear and just the worst of humankind is involved in the circumstances that lead to somebody becoming infected with HIV. Yeah. I think, I mean, sometimes it's completely, but there's always, there's always some negative element of human nature that allows that to occur because it's preventable. Mm -hmm. So um, I got really depressed after that. But I still, um, yeah. I still loved the idea of filmmaking. And then um, I took some time off and just went traveling myself. And that was also weird because like, I'd be in Thailand and I'd be two hours away from the AIDS hospice I'd been visiting before or the brothels that I'd been visiting before, sitting on a beach and going, 
<sighs> I can't relax because I know all that stuff is still going on. Yeah. Um, so how how do you reconcile with that? I mean, you've seen so many different parts of the 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 you know worst of humanity, like you said, not just with that project, but with some others that you and I have talked about. So tell us how how, how do you that? reconcile it? How do you oh, reconcile it within yourself? You know, like it, there's, it's like the, this feeling of powerlessness that all of us feel to some extent, right? But w I would feel that just watching a doc about this, I can't imagine being on the front lines and experience it, it literally for your in in your own with through your own eyes, you know, mm -hmm. and then having to like sort of try to b balance that with the privileges that we have in our own lives. Um, and going about it. So how, like, it, was there ever a point where you had to go, well, I can't get depressed after every one of these projects. I have to have a different set of tools to help me navigate this if I'm going to keep doing this kind of work. Yes. Um, well, after the age of AIDS, I was really not in a good place. And I was also, again, pretty self-righteous. Like, I, you know, my mom would make some comment about needing a new lampshade and I'd be like so lucky we have electricity <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know um <laughs> so obnoxious <laughs> like, like um but I well so two things happen w one I I was wandering around thinking what can I do to help particularly with children that were in um brothels or even factories whatever and I thought, well, I can't go in and I can't bust in and pull them all out. <laughs> <laughs> but I had just seen an inconvenient truth. And I saw, for me, the power of that film was in the very simple messaging at the end in the credits that was just like, you could do this and you could do this and you could do this. And I was like, oh. they allowed people to leave the theater with an idea like understanding a problem and with a tangible action that they could take, even if it's small. Yeah. And I thought, Oh my gosh, that, and, and then I was in uh, Delhi and I was, tr I was trying to walk across this little like log over this nasty swamp kind of Creek thing to get into this slum because <laughs> It just looked interesting when I, I like I came up on the train and I because I like to like get on a train and go all the way to the end if it's above ground to like explore the city as I go. And when I came up to this last stop, there was a incredibly disgusting slum up next to a really well manicured garden and this massive beautiful building. So I was like, I got to check this out. And I walked up and it was the East Asian headquarters of the World Health Organization. Mm. So that was kind of mind blowing, like right next to the, the, the worst slum I'd ever seen. Anyway, wow. so I wanted to walk down in there and this, there was this group of people that were huddled around this little television. And this woman turned to look at me and she was like, no, like, do not come in here. <laughs> and they had somehow like rigged up this television and they were watching a Hallmark movie. And I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> film gets everywhere. You yeah. Know? Like people, yeah. people love it. So I decided to move back to LA and go to USC to the Peter Stark producing program. But I applied and while I was waiting to see if I got in, through people that I'd known in other jobs, I ended up getting a job running the documentary division of this new rock doc company. Um, so I figured it would be better to be paid to learn. Yeah, to learn on the job. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, but the question, I'm sorry, I went on a complete tangent. The reconciling is, okay, I'm going to do something about it. So as long as I'm as long as I know I'm working towards doing something about it, I can handle the shit. Yeah. 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 You can and handle then, relaxing on the beach because you're going to the next day go do something about it. Essentially. I'm not very good at. Metaphorically. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, no, I mean, I can, I struggle with it every day. Like, should I just, 
be out there on the front lines volunteering and da, 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 da. and yes i should be doing that no matter what and i'm often not because i'm working on a film but <laughs> i also know that i can have a greater impact potentially with a film to get the conversation going and you never know who's going to pick it up and what they're going to do with it yeah so that's how i reconcile it um that i I don't know. My, my list of things I need to do in the world is very long. <laughs> well, you, you have big ambitions to do good things for the world. And that's kind of what happens, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I also reconcile it for myself. I practice Reiki. Yeah. So that yes. helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then you get into this doc division of this company yeah and then what kind of projects were you doing there is that when did you do the defiant ones well that was years later years this, later okay yeah um the first one i did with them was um with scorsese george harrison living in the material i've heard world. i've heard of these uh, yeah i've heard of him you heard of these people <laughs> loosely i've heard of them <laughs> rings a bell yeah. yeah yeah um and i was just like the production executive so it was my first foray into looking at budgets and understanding what's happening with them. I had to teach myself movie magic budgeting over How Christmas. How was that? <laughs> How was that journey? Tell us about that. Well, I didn't have the program, so my parents gave it to me as a Christmas present, and I taught <laughs> myself over the whole day. I just like looked at other budgets and was like, "Okay, that's how you do that. Got it." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's movie just magic is as a um staple of the industry that you know has is just software that's super outdated and i love love them i just wish they would come up with like a little better talk about a first world problem you know what i mean like just <laughs> can you can we come up with a little cleaner smoother more 2020 friendly version of that software but it is still pretty much like at least in the feature television doc space commercials have different budgets they use but yeah yeah, it's it's a fun software to learn. I don't know. I liked it. <laughs> I enjoy it. I love yeah. budgeting, actually. If there's something very I, calming and therapeutic about it. I really like budgeting. I yeah. don't like tracking a budget and being the person who every day has to oh, say, yeah. how much money do we have left in there? And no, That's you why you have an accountant. And, yeah, and the line producer, ideally. Um, well, depends on the show, but yes. yes. It totally depends on the show. But I do love the process of creating the budget because I think it goes hand in hand with the creative. Mm -hmm. And and if you do it well, you avoid however long period of time, a year, year and a half of stress. <laughs> but if you don't do it well, yeah, you're setting everyone in your team up for a year of stress. It's a, it's an art form, believe yeah. believe you me. I think it's it's a skill that can be very undervalued by a lot of people. It's not just like throwing numbers on a thing. It really takes a lot of creative thought and yeah. problem solving exactly how for are things we that pull this off. Yeah, you have to think about okay, well we don't know how or when or we don't know any of those things, but I have to think through all of the known possibilities in this moment in time and make a plan for yeah. that. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's really tricky. It's especially tricky. Well, it depends who, who you're working with. Like uh, the Defiant ones, we originally budgeted as a 90 minute film to be completed in a year. Yeah. And within moments of doing the first <laughs> interviews, it was very clear that, the, that it was a series. And it may Tell have always been clear to other people, but it became clear that that was going to have to be like the the studio was going to have to get on board with this. This is not a yeah. 90 minute film. <laughs> no. And, and I'm glad it wasn't. I mean, the defiant ones is still one of my favorite doc series, which is what it became. Um, it, it just, everything about it was so fascinating. And the editing, the sound, the sound editing was just like so cool. The way yeah. that it well, was structured. Alan, the director is yeah. obsessive about sound in the best way. Well, it shows. I mean, yeah. it's and so the, I mean, it's a, it's a, film about sound it's about yeah. two of the leaders in the world of sound so yeah yeah that's a pretty important element if you have not a quick plug for the defiant ones if you have not seen it it please tell it give us like a quick little what is it about tell everybody 
Um, it's a four part series on HBO about the lives of Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre and how they, Jimmy sort of took over the world of rock and Dr. Dre the world of hip hop and they came together and then ultimately created beats and uh, their own school, their own academy at USC. Yeah. And the rest is, is history. Yeah. It's it's amazing. It's great. I, I had no I had no idea Jimmy Iovine had been around so long. He like worked like any musician you can probably name from the past like 40 years. He's worked with them. Yeah. <laughs> You're and like, "How greats. old are you? All the greats, <laughs> you know?" It's like, "What are where is the the fountain of youth that you're drinking from that you <laughs> It looks like he's been around for 100 years. He's like <laughs> worked with Ella Fitzgerald." No, I'm kidding, but he could have. You know? He might have. He might have. <laughs> he who knows? probably did. <laughs> but no, it's it's an incredible doc series. Um like I said, just check it out. It's still up on HBO, right? It's been a while, yeah. but it's still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. So check it out if you do. Tag us, um, let us know what you thought of it. Yeah, I actually, so the joke ah. with HBO as well. And and that was, it was like seven years before the Defiant Ones. But when, when I got the call for the Defiant Ones, it was because of the George Harrison project. Yeah. Because um, that was another one that went on far longer than they thought it would and cost a lot more than they thought it would yeah a lot of docs fall into that trap i find um yeah you know and it's part i think because of what you were saying at the top of this combo of like there's a lack of development and planning of like well what is this what what do we want this to be what do we have the time to let this be mm -hmm. and then when you start peeling back the layers you're like oh wow there's so much here and then it just becomes this exponential thing that essentially can never end if you don't put an end date and a kibosh to it because it's like you're talking about people's lives and that is ever changing and um just it's hard to quantify a start an end point in production or anything to, to someone's experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's helpful when you're dealing with what's happened in the past, but even then I think people have a tendency in the doc world to make things longer than they need to be. And mm. this is something that um, I remember Eva Orner saying very early on when we were doing Bikram is she wanted to make this a 90 minute film. And there are people who would have made it a series because there's a lot there, but, she wanted to be disciplined about it. So I think that there can be a lack of discipline when people are doing um, projects on subjects that they really love and really passionate yeah. about. They want to, you know, it can be hard to discipline yourself in that, but sometimes it just warrants it. But so those things can be tough to budget because you don't, especially if they're archive heavy and you haven't done the research up front with the archive as well. You can spend extra weeks, extra months digging through all that in the edit. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but the mm -hmm. ones that are even harder to budget are the ones that are happening in real time in front of you. Yeah. Es especially something like rescuing child slaves. You don't know what's going <laughs> to happen at any moment of any day. <laughs> it's um, it's it's insane i think every movie is a mirror if every movie is a miracle every like narrative film is a miracle that it gets made with a plan and a script and a blueprint then a doc is like what's the next level from a miracle i don't even know <laughs> like the the fact that any documentary gets completed and then can you know have a massive impact or reach the, the level of like winning a Sundance or winning a Grammy or winning these awards, I think is just so astronomical because the odds are so stacked against you at every step of the way. Anything yeah. can and will go wrong, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I, I have nothing but respect for the line producer of the current series that I'm working on because I can't even imagine yeah. what the coronavirus <laughs> outbreak has done to production we're really lucky because we yeah. have an editor who is from italy and we mm. pivoted to a remote workflow and at a certain stage in a doc you make the film in the edit yeah so we're yeah. lucky so you guys are finishing up that project then it sounds like you're in post -editorial. we're in post yeah and we're getting towards our third cut so this series that i'm doing is um half doc and half scripted because I really want to move more into the scripted space mm. um, just because 
Well, I, so have you seen the documentary, The Devil We Know? No, I haven't. Um, or the film Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo? I haven't. Oh, God, I, I'm the worst. Well, uh, they're both about the same subject, which okay. happens to be this town in West Virginia where I w grew up and went mm. to school. I was born in wow. Vancouver and then we moved to West Virginia. I went to school in this little town and DuPont is there and it's all about how the water is poisoned mm. and many, many, many people in the town got cancer, had cancer. Um, anyway, I saw the documentary at Sundance a couple of years ago and then just this past year, I saw the scripted film and I was like, I, for me personally, the scripted film was so much more impactful. Like it, it just because it's character driven in yeah. a way that the doc is it is but it's not predominantly character -driven, right you know right 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 and so they wrap the issue into this and then they have a campaign attached to the back of the film and i was like that's what i want to do <laughs> so i'm trying to move more into the narrative space but um yeah. so we will uh get our film to the point where everything is edited but then we have storyboards for what the recreations will be. And we'll go out and shoot those in the summer once the lockdown has lifted. Yeah. Then go back so you you're it. almost done with that yes. project then. You're towards yeah. the end. Okay, cool. Okay, so George Harrison. Yes. You have this incredible experience. And then Kailash, Price of Free. Um, I guess – in all of this journey, and, and I, oh, I want to talk about, there's so many questions. Well, okay. So the question is, we talked about the last time I interviewed you. I think you had just, it was, I think, was it 2018? Is that possible? Yeah. yeah, it was. Because you had just come from the Kailash Dock, Price of Free, winning Sundance. And mm -hmm. then you, you had hopped on a flight and you went to the Grammys and won a Grammy. Yeah. for the defiant ones and then you had to go somewhere else right after that because you mentioned that experience being a bit of a blur so I think oftentimes people look at when we find moments of success and validation in the form of prizes or notoriety and, and awards and festivals and they think oh well that's like that's the thing and that's the moment you have made it you know and they think that that is all that it is or that is all that we should aspire to is for uh -huh. these sort of accolades as someone who has won a lot of these accolades will you speak a little bit to what that experience was like and 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 then just having to go back to like real life after that <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well first of all I mean it's uh, of course it's very validating in some yeah. way that you know you're peers in the industry say hey you did good job <laughs> like yeah so that that just feels good and i i know that i suffer from and i think a lot of people suffer from a little bit of imposter syndrome because you're mm -hmm. you, you're always thinking like oh god i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> Maybe yeah. not you, but like I happens feel like that lot. all the time, actually, all like, the what time. Do do? What do I do? What do I do? Yeah. And, and like, oh, God, I'm failing at, at this. Like, yep. even as Guilty. you're succeeding and that's, that's mm -hmm. unhealthy and that's a subject for another podcast. I know. I need to have a therapist, an actual therapist on here and just record like a session and share that with everybody because yeah. it's, it's true. It's true. Yeah. All the time. Um, Never goes away. And you also, you just forget how hard it is when you're at the beginning of something, you're like, it's going to be so great. And you just, you just forget <laughs> how hard yeah. it can be. Um, so it's nice to have people say, hey, good job on that one. But then it also is obviously tremendously helpful in opening doors to other projects. And now I'll have people just randomly hit me up on Facebook and say, hey, do you have any interest in this amazing story and I'm like, yeah yeah I do <laughs> we should talk you know which I never would have nobody would have come to me with those ideas before maybe so it's good it's a good thing it's a good um, thing for sure yeah it's it's a very good thing but um it's also a little surreal um yeah 
I mean, I don't, I don't know. I <laughs> completely inarticulate about this because it's 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 fun and it's funny, but it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day, and it doesn't make any difference. Um, like I don't know. I remember Stephen Merchant, this stand-up comedian, coming to do this little tiny gig at a pub in London. And he pulled, someone started heckling him and he pulled his golden globe out of the bag and put it on the stool. And he's <laughs> like, I carry this with me because you never know when I'm going to need it. <laughs> like, and I remember joking with TJ and Dan after Undefeated won the Oscar and asking them if they were going to like take it in the meetings with them <laughs> just to be like, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> I know, right? It's it's a really interesting phenomenon. But I think like a lot of people have this perception or this idea that like, oh, when I get this award, when I get this validation from my peers in the industry, then I'll have fill in the blank, you know, whether that's have made it or there are doors Gosh, that no. open. But I think I think it, it, it can create this impression that that if that's all you're after, I think it's going to be a very um, unhappy life that you're setting yourself up for because that experience is like a f- minuscule it's, fraction of yeah for the me it whole. was 48 hours <laughs> yeah in, of in your journey ju- <laughs> yes of your entire journey years. exactly yes um yeah and you still have to do good work coming mm-hmm. out of that like you <laughs> can't just be like i did that i'm done like I hope I live for a long time. If I was done now, I would be so bored. I know. Like, what um, would you do? But it was like a year after that, right? So I, I started turning jobs down because I didn't want to do them. And that was a big deal for me. But it led to a period last summer where one job had finished and I didn't have another job on the horizon. And I didn't work it was by choice but i ended up not working for about five months which is a long time and um towards the end of that i was like oh gosh (laughs) am i going to work again (laughs) um (laughs) which is a stupid thought to have because yeah you know all i have to do is look (laughs) to see if there's work and there's always work yeah um or you make it yourself and sell it yourself. I don't know. Anyway, it, you know, point being, it doesn't mean you don't still have to hustle. That's right. In fact, I wonder if it makes you have to hustle, like maybe the upfront hustle isn't as hard to get the jobs or to get in rooms with people, but then it's this hustle is almost like on the tail end where you have to consistently be doing now work at that level and collaborating yeah. with people at that level because yeah. if you go back then they're like oh maybe she was a hack or maybe how did she get in here who let her in you know <laughs> she got a pass we we can't have that riffraff in here you know um i speak for myself when i say riffraff not you you're not riffraff um but you know I, I, yeah there's that there's that pressure and i think it is insurmountable and a lot of people think that they want that but once they get there they go oh shit now i gotta like keep all these balls spinning at at a higher altitude so to speak with less air (laughs) you know yeah I I, yeah I guess so you do you want to keep up the caliber of work and it's like oh well why didn't that one get nominated (laughs) right and then you go into this other problem of expecting that everything you do should be like the Midas touch you're winning something (laughs) why what like yeah yeah you have to do really good work yeah I think it's like if you're if you're proud of it and and it gets that kind of recognition, then I mean that's the dream scenario. You know, you're yeah. doing good work that you're proud of. That's actually helping the world. It's like, you know, I remember my tiny version of your experience is when Autism in Love, you know, premiered world premiered at Tribeca, and that was like, we did get nominated for an Emmy a year or two later. But I just remember, even though the Emmy experience was so surreal and cool the fact that I got to premiere the first thing I ever really produced feature length at a festival that I deemed super massive 
And it was such an important story that like seeing the faces of parents and people on the spectrum come up to us after screenings and tell us how much this movie made an impact for them. And then getting to have this world stage that a festival like Tribeca provides um, to share that, I remember feeling like, oh, like it doesn't, it doesn't get better than this. Like this is as good as it's ever going to get is getting to sit in a room full of people who are truly touched and impacted by your work for a consecutive week and then get to do press and go to parties and talk about that thing. And, and then everything that comes after that is just a regurgitation of that experience, you know, but, but I remember being like, okay, like this is, this is the thing. This is the thing everybody talks about. And I've tasted that thing and it's great, but like, I don't want to, I'm going to chase that high forever, but I don't want my journey to be defined by, by this is the only part of it that matters. And if I don't get to that part again with other projects, then those projects aren't worth it. You know, yeah. it was a really great like turning point for me and like not idealizing and like romanticizing all of this stuff that festivals right, and awards can bring you. People, it's just real people in a room. <laughs> yes. Yes. I miss people in a room. I miss <laughs> theaters. I do. It's magical. It really is. Like, anyway, on that on we'll that note, back. we'll get back. We'll get back. But um, I do because it's. Remember, I told you like I can talk a lot. It's already been almost an hour that we've been talking. Just oh, FYI, wow. I, I okay. know. So I do want to get into a little bit of, um, you know, in your journey because I like talking about Kaka and the messy parts of it and yeah. navigating through like these periods of career lulls and being in the valleys of it. Um, how has that been for you? And how have you continued to like suit up, armor up, especially given some of the work you've done that is um, very challenging, uh, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. How, how do you find that inertia to keep yourself going? Um, I'm just... I'm, I'm pretty obsessive about the idea that we, there, we have created certain problems on planet Earth and we have to be able to solve them. We just have to be able to solve them. So I'm constantly looking for stories about people who are solving them or experiencing problems. And so because I'm putting that out there all the time, it's always coming back to me. So my periods of not working like I said, that was the first time I've ever been like afraid that I wasn't going to work again. And it didn't last very long, <laughs> it didn't last very long, but, <laughs> but, um, I just was like, Oh, don't be ridiculous. Just send out some resumes. I just, I'm, I just move forward because I just move forward. I get bored really easily. Yeah. And so I have to be doing something, learning something, looking for something, you know, it's, it's almost unhealthy to the point where if I have yeah. like 10 minutes, I'm like, what should I be doing with this 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like want we're cut from the same cloth. You and I sister. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like um, I was like, like listening to like a TikTok panel and like brand did content right up until like I called you, you know, cause that's, I'm just like, ah, gotta yeah, be learning I, stuff. I, I should be learning more. I need to have a period of learning instead of doing. Mm. Um, eh, it's overrated. You can learn <laughs> while you're doing. Yeah, I know. I'll try. <laughs> I know. Um, I just got an offer to or to talk to some people about another project, and it's on a subject I've never heard of before. Nice. And so I looked them up, and it's an author, and it got the book is on its way. And I'm like, even if mm -hmm. I don't do this job, I got like – a gift with this one because it's yeah. about like tools for creativity um that's anyway awesome. so i don't know i just i i get fired up by like i said before i practice reiki and that in any moment when i'm freaking out i just say the five basic rules of reiki and i'm like good i'm good <laughs> what are the moment, what are the what are the five basic rules of reiki just for this moment <laughs> Do not be angry. Do not worry. Be grateful for whatever it is you have that allows you to fulfill your duties. 
and be good to your fellow man. I love it. So I just like take that in for a minute. Cause like the other day we had a deadline to hit and we worked very hard to do this. Like I was out past midnight a few, a few nights and at 6.30 on the Friday night that the cut was due, they said, I want some more time with this. Contacted the network and the network said, no problem, turn it in next Friday. And I did not go right to a place of gratitude. <laughs> 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 I went right to a place of anger. <laughs> but you like, got there eventually. Got yeah, there eventually. I absolutely got there. I, I literally had to be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> do not be angry. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I mean, I think I, I can say this because I you are my friend. And I, I think that so much of what I we have not worked together yet. But so much of what I know of you and your heart and your soul and like, all of these lessons that you've been so lovely in teaching me and it informs so much of like my own experience and my own journey, whether or not we're in constant contact. It's just been it's such a pleasure like knowing you and I don't mean to make this oh, like a love you. fest podcast, but like, but it's true. You know, I think it's important to lift up, not that you need my lifting, but to give listeners the opportunity to hear your story and your perspectives, because I think they're so important. And I know we, on the last time we recorded a lot of what we talked about was how you had mentioned to me that, you know, all of this incredible stuff had happened with Kailash, the doc, and then like Sundance and then the Grammy. And then like, there was no press done on you. No journalists talked to you. Like nobody's really sat down and talked to you about your story. And, may and maybe oh. I'm remembering that incorrectly, but I think that's what you said. Maybe at that time and that maybe it's changed. Hopefully. Um, well, one person did sit down to talk to me about my journey. We, um, my, hometown newspaper yes in West I remember Virginia. <laughs> but I I just couldn't believe it I was like this is this is one of the most like notable producers of our time who's doing incredible work who's on the front line and nobody's talking to her no one's listening to her journey and so it's just important for me if I can be a vessel for others to listen to these conversations and hear some of this and hopefully it can inspire or incite some action in whatever journey they're on, you know, whatever path they're on, whatever kind of producer they want to be or really a filmmaker. I mean, I think the podcast really isn't like, so you want to be a producer kid? Like, come on. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's really more, more like everybody who is an artist, who is creative, who is navigating this journey of, this industry can can relate to some of this stuff hopefully and so i'm always speaking of gratitude like i really i'm always so grateful that people like yourselves take the time to sit and talk to me and hear me babble and like rec let me record their stories to share with others because that's i get so much joy out of out of doing it you know well, it really thank brings you me for doing it you didn't babble at all i was like whoa oh, i feel like i'm always just like a hot mess just like talking and because of the portuguese i don't say my metaphors right it's always like a hot mess but um but no so okay i want what i wanted to end on is you know anybody listening who has ambitions to sort of mirror a career your career path particularly um what advice do you have for them? And what are some takeaways you would like listeners to have as well about the misconceptions people may have about what you do? Like how better informed can our industry be about the kind of producing you do? Um, it, okay. I, it was I, like two questions in one. Yeah, it was two questions all, in sorry. one. And I and I just thought of that line from the end of that um, article that was in the Chicago Tribune in 1997 that Baz Luhrmann turned into like a song. And at the end, she says, um, "Advice is a form of nostalgia, and dispensing it is like taking the past out of the garbage, dusting it off, and selling it for more than it's worth." <laughs> Damn, <laughs> um, knowledge bomb dropped. <laughs> but um, I, I would say uh, don't be afraid of hard work. <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously or anything that you're doing too seriously. But take it seriously enough to work hard. <laughs> um, uh, don't take things too personally especially mm. in the age of email and text message 
And that's just like, I don't, I'm still learning how to not read tone of voice into things. Yeah. Um, my own tone of voice. But like, just, it's not, it's never a, it, this is such cliche knowledge, but it's not about you. <laughs> It's just about the project. And is that person making the best decision for the project? Are you making the best decision for the project? What does the project need? And just thinking ahead, always thinking ahead, like what needs to happen next? And that I think is the really the role of a, particularly a doc producer and especially a doc that's happening in real time, but just in general, like keeping an eye on the horizon. I remember somebody gave me this advice one time that um, if you're in charge, make sure you find somebody else to do the stuff that keeps their head down. Because if your head is down, nobody's watching the whole thing. So mm. if somebody comes to you with the task, your responsibility is to delegate it, even though you might be a hands-on kind of person, because it's the kind of task that is going to take your head down. And you have to keep your head up um, and just first for, for see what's coming, you know, before anybody else does. Yeah. Um, but just, I don't know, being aware of the possibilities and being super flexible because reality is going to change. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like a plan is, you know, immediately gets thrown out the window the moment you go into production. It's just like good homework to do yeah exactly. a lot of the times it's like yeah. you've done the homework so you know but don't rely on it because because <laughs> anything could happen and it will yeah. happen you know and it's always the things you don't prepare for it's always the things that you're like ah yes the one thing I didn't think about here yeah, we are like in India when they the government shut down the money and all of our cash was suddenly not I can't not even possible to use speaking yeah. of life with Kaka I actually got a goat shat on my foot in a field <laughs> in India. <laughs> it's a good luck, isn't it? In some countries? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't some feel like the best Maybe. of luck. I also, one night, this might be a little bit gross, but one night at the, like, there we were staying with these villagers and there was like a hole in the ground outside and a rat ran over my foot. Oh my God. Thank you for whispering that. So the the rat doesn't hear you or the people in the village. It's appreciated. Yeah. Super gross. That's not okay. normal. Anyway. One last question. Yes. <laughs> Cause I just forgot. I wanted to ask you this. You you've worked on some incredible things. You've been a part of bringing some incredible stories to, to life and shining a light onto some out of control experiences that real people are having uh, in our world what if any or which would you say are you most proud of of the works that you've done definitely the price of free yeah because that was a lot of very 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 hard work and also very rewarding and i believe that kailash is one of the most inspirational humans on the planet so that was yeah lovely um Bikram actually I thought it was a really good film <laughs> I really liked uh the process of working with Eva and Kimberly Hassett it's amazing yeah um, it was just um so I'm proud of that one and the defiant ones obviously although I wasn't as involved in the creative I was just mm -hmm. part of sort of setting it up to make sure it happened but I'm proud that it happened yeah. um and the George Harrison project was really special to me because all of his friends, getting to meet his friends and hearing their philosophy on life and learning about his philosophy on life, as the first time I read Autobiography of a Yogi, <laughs> um, was just a really unique and special experience because I Honestly, think if you haven't seen the second half of that film, it teaches you how to be a better human. Of the George Harrison doc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I really love that one. But I mean, there's, I'm proud of a lot of them. Proud of the yeah. Age of AIDS. Well, uh, you've done some incredible work. I mean, you should be proud of all of it. But I was just curious if like there was any particular one that... Stood yeah. out. It would be Stood Kailash. Out, yeah. yeah, I mean, Kailash is... What a once-in-a-lifetime experience, you know? Yeah. 
to get to be a part of that. Such important work. Such an it's important super mission. weird though when it ended and it's still weird now because that was the, I, that was my like vision for 10 years. Like I'm mm. going to do a doc about child slavery. It came to me completely randomly. I didn't cause it to happen in any way. But once that had happened, it was like, now what? And I still don't know. <laughs> Well, I have no doubt if there's anyone who can figure it out, Miss Sarah Anthony, it is you. <laughs> we'll keep you posted. <laughs> keep you posted. We'll do a revisit when you've gone to the next tier of being awesome oh, and you can teach us all about it. <laughs> okay. But but thank you so much. If there's yeah, nothing else you want to say. Of course. Thank you for taking the time and sharing this time with us. So I'm going to stop recording. So say bye-bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye.